and uh, we will, uh, yeah, our next speaker is uh, Portia Anderson, I hope I'm saying that right, uh, who will tell us about edge swapping symmetries of Knuts and Tau puzzles with hexagonal and parallelogram shaped boundary. Uh, Thank you. Um... Oh, and I guess uh, we should, yeah, uh, wait until you have your slides here. Um, yeah. Good. Okay. So, so you can see that? Yes. Please go ahead. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, it's actually Portia, but that's okay. Um, Sorry. Yeah, no problem. Um, okay. So this is... Um, going to be about uh, this interplay between um, this combinatorial puzzle method of doing Schubert calculus and the geometric um, perspective. So uh, Schubert calculus is about computing structure constants in the cohomology ring of the Grassmannian. And um, true to the origins of this area of math, um, one way is to uh, look at transverse intersections um, triple intersections and count the points. Um, so that's one way. And then we also have puzzles, which uh, compute the same constants. And so um, sometimes uh, an observation or symmetry that's clear on, on one side, like the puzzle side, um, can show us something we didn't expect on the geometry side and vice versa. And so we'll, we'll um, see some some good examples of that with uh, this project I've been working on. Okay, so here is um, the R space that we'll be working in, of course, is the Grassmannian of K planes in C N. And so uh, that is a smooth complex manifold and projective variety. And um, we have, uh, uh, we have these Schubert varieties um, and we index them, uh, especially for puzzles with binary strings with uh, K ones and N minus K zeros. And we can think of those interchangeably with uh, partitions that fit in a K by N minus K rectangle. So, and then we have opposite Schubert varieties, which give us a dual basis. Um, oh, sorry, I didn't even say, okay, Schubert varieties give us a, a, an integral basis for the cohomology of the Grassmannian. And then the opposite Schubert varieties give us a dual basis for that. And we have uh, with this perfect pairing, which is um, taking the integral of product of two of them. Um, which I will say what that integral is talking about more uh, soon. So, okay, let's define a puzzle. A, okay, so let's let this um, triangle uh, lambda mu nu uh, denote this boundary shown here on the right. So, we take this equilateral triangle and then we label the, the edges with strings of ones and zeros. And they go, they're red in the orientation shown. And okay, so then those are our lambda mu nu. And then a puzzle is a, is a filling of this boundary with um, pieces in this allowed set here. And um, the way you fill them in is just as you would expect, like a jigsaw puzzle where you have to align um, the any touching edges of the pieces such that they have the same number. Okay. And then at the bottom here is just some random examples of what these things look like. Okay, so then we have this uh, theorem by um, my advisor, Alan Knudsen and Terry Tao. And it says that puzzles 
do Schubert calculus, basically. So puzzles compute the structure constants for the um, cohomology of the Grossmannian in the Schubert variety basis. So what that means is for these uh, product expansions of two Schubert varieties, um, you expand that out in the Schubert variety basis and um, the coefficients you get are these constants. And, and so the uh, C lambda mu nu equals the number of C lambda, or sorry, of lambda mu nu puzzles. And this, and then here is the like geometry version of this. And if that's unclear what this integral is, which it was to me for a long time, um, the integral, you can think of it as pushed forward to a point and then how we turn this into like an intersection theory kind of um, problem is uh, you can, if your varieties intersect transversely, the class, um, the product of their classes is the class of their intersection. And so we can, we can like squish them into one class with their, their intersection in there. And we want to turn it into a triple transverse intersection. We have to perturb, you know, at least one of these with um, something in GLN to to make it transverse. And then we the the integral counts the intersection points if it's a finite intersection and it returns zero otherwise. Okay. And then here's just an example of puzzles computing um, some structure constants. So what if we want to expand out the product um, x0101 zero one, zero one squared? So then we put those 0101 zero one, zero one, um, strings, our lambda and mu, on the sides of a boundary. And then we fill in um, as many puzzles as we can find. And then what ends up coming out is just two. And then we have one with the new equals 0110, zero one, zero, and then new equals 1001. Zero, zero, one. So then the C lambda mu news for those news is one, and then everything else is zero. So then that tells us that this expands out to this um, sum here. All right, um, now we're moving on to um, think about some puzzles with different boundary shapes, which is pretty uh, unorthodox, I guess, because normally they're always uh, triangles. So we're gonna do parallelograms and in the next slide, we're going to talk about how to take this and complete it to a triangle so we can think about it as a normal Schubert calculus problem. Okay, so let's take a parallelogram boundary shape and we're gonna label it with strings of zeros and ones going clockwise and we demand that the um, two opposite labels have to have the same content, um, which means the same number of zeros and ones, and uh, same for alpha and beta. And that's what this sort notation is saying. So sort means take all the zeros in the string and put them ahead of all the ones. So this is just saying um, alpha and beta have the same content and same with lambda and mu. And then, what we do is we can complete this thing to a triangle uh, in a trivial way. So we glue on these gray triangles where, um, so with this, these labels, um, turns out that if you have a, a string of zeros and ones, and then you have another uh, label on the other side, say beta in this case, then that forces this other edge to, match beta. So um, gluing these on just forces these to be the same and it preserves this like inner parallelogram. So we can just glue those on and chop them off um, <clears throat> you know, as much as we want. And so that gives a bijection between these puzzles and ones like these. So, and then we have a geometric way of thinking of this. Um, as a you know, uh, ordinary Schubert calculus problem. Okay, and then the next thing to note um, is 
that if you rotate this parallelogram puzzle 180 degrees, then you get another one um, of the same sort. Okay, so that says that we um, this rotation gives us a bijection from <clears throat> parallelogram puzzles with uh, labels going around this way and just the rotated version. Um, so that is silly from the puzzle perspective, but we want to ask about the geometric meaning. So let's put those two bijections we just saw together. So we, um, we have this bijection with gluing on these triangles. So we follow that up. Here we can rotate the parallelogram 180 degrees, and then we come back down and complete that again. So now we have this triangle here with alpha and beta on there, and then here um, they're swapped, and same with lambda and mu. And so this is, you know, making this equality is claiming something about um, something geometric. And so uh, the first question I wanted to answer was why? Uh, why is that? So how can we understand this geometrically or prove it? So when we did that, we ended up finding a stronger symmetry actually, which um, is a combinatorial statement, which we don't understand combinatorially. Um, <clears throat> so, okay, so that says that we can just swap um, two of the opposite edge labels instead of both pairs at the same time, which would be the rotation. So if we just swap alpha and beta, then we get the same number of puzzles still. And okay, and then this picture kind of is sh suggesting how this was done, which was that we had to sneak through this, this triangle uh, version to in order to prove that equality. And we don't know how to just directly combinatorially prove this. Okay. And then, by the way, this also is true for if we allow some of these different special pieces, which compute different cohomology theories. Okay, so we can, yes, and we can also swap lambda and mu. Um, so here's just a, a glimpse of a, a cute little puzzle-based way to do this, which is where you commute sides of the triangles because puzzles have commutativity because um, the cohomology classes commute. So you commute these sides triangle, it turns into this. Um, and then you can fix this edge down here. And then again, you can commute the sides of this triangle. Uh, so you get the same number and then you just follow it around. Um, that's, yeah. So that's just a brief uh, glimpse of that. And it doesn't work for equivariant because that piece has no rotations. Um, so, okay. And then I'm just going to probably blaze through this really fast. So it turns out that this yellow bit, this yellow parallelogram can only have at most one filling. And then it does have a filling. Um, if and only if these, these fixed labels down here, eta and theta, fulfill a certain condition in relation to each other. So, um, so we sum and that is, you know, the theta choice has to be unique to eta. So we call them eta and eta prime. And we sum over choices of eta. And then it turns out this the number of these is the sum of products of Littlewood Richardson numbers, where one of them is the number of puzzles in this green triangle. The other is the number of puzzles in this. So it's kind of nice that we can write as a product of Littlewood Richardson numbers. And then here's the um, just a, a glance of the geometric uh, version of that. Um, okay, and then we have this uh, stronger thing coming up where, so we have these uh, puzzles, as I mentioned, that with this special piece that computes the structure of constants and the equivariant cohomology, um, T equivariant cohomology of the Grassmannian. And so those constants live in this polynomial ring uh, in n variables over z. 
And it's just, it's a richer version of ordinary cohomology. So if you prove something, we prove this here, then it's also proved for the ordinary. And these, uh, how do these compute these polynomial structure constants? Well, each of these special pieces contributes a weight, um, yj minus yi, which is given by where it's located in the puzzle. And then to get the weight of a whole, the whole puzzle, you take the product of all the weights of the pieces, and then the structure constant is the sum of all the weights of all the puzzles that you can get with um, those edge labels. Okay, and then here is this result about swapping edges of equivariant parallelograms. So if we take the same exact setup, and now we're allowing those special equivariant um, rhombus pieces, then what happens to the structure constant if we, if we swap alpha and beta? So it turns out that- Five minutes left. Okay. Um, it turns out that what that does is you, it's a permutation of the variables in the uh, structure constant. And <clears throat> so, so for, uh, let's look at the alpha and beta case. So if you are swapping alpha and beta, you look at, uh, here's this permutation that will act on the structure constant. So what it does is reverses the first A um, variables, the first uh, Y1 through YA, and leaves the, the others alone. Um, and then, yeah, so, so that is, this here is saying that if you swap alpha and beta, you, the effect on the structure constant is just you're reversing Y1 through YA and then leaving the, Oh, and then leaving the, the rest of them alone. Uh, and then swapping lambda mu is something very similar, but you're reversing the, the last, um, what are the last variables? Okay, and then this is just a very brief flash of what the geometric proof is like, where it's, you pull the problem back to this product of smaller Grossmannians. Um, so, and then we, also have this to take it a little bit further and we find that the actually the number of these equivariant um, parallelogram puzzles is the same as when you swap and that that is not automatic so, so in these equivariant puzzles sometimes you can have even the same structure constant but you will have a different number of puzzles um, say for a commuted version and then they just add up to the same polynomial so this is not um, a given so and the proof of that is simple though. And anyway, so this bijection is definitely not understood combinatorially at this point. And then this is just a brief flash of like an example. So this is some of these puzzles, um, the set of all of them, and then you swap lambda mu and then you get these. So just a glimpse. And finally, hexagons. So we, we can ask, we can generalize some of this stuff to questions about hexagons because, you know, a parallelogram is a degenerate hexagon for one thing. We can do this thing where we complete that to a triangle in a very similar way. And then we can, we also ask this question about 180 degree rotation yielding a bijection between these. And that was a weirder problem because this is, you know, it can be a bigger triangle than this. So a different Grossmannian and everything. Um, so, I did prove that for ordinary homology at least. And then we also find the similar uh, edge swapping result for hexagons with like symmetric edge content. So there's these two cases that are nice where the first one is the opposite edges have the same number of ones and zeros. The other one is you have this like three way symmetry of the same content. And then for each of those, you can, you can swap between those um, symmetric edges and and end up with the same number of puzzles. So two, two minutes left. Okay. Um, so the, yeah, this is the last slide. So this is just um, further questions that I'm interested in. So it's, um, we want to extend these results potentially to other cohomology theories. So do these um, can we swap edges and get the same number of puzzles or, you know, what does that even mean? What is the right question to ask for some of these 
these other ones. So like there's the K theory version and we have these puzzles with an upside, the uh, right side up 10, 10, 10 that computes the um, structure sheaf basis and the upside down 10, 10, 10 that compute the ideal sheaf basis and the, yeah, the parallelogram symmetry kind of implies something interesting with that. I don't think, I would like to understand the geometry of this better and then, you know, equivariant hexagons. Um, I haven't really built much into that. I'm not sure what the right question to really ask would be right now. And then lastly, there's these Segre, Schwartz, McPherson classes, which have both the 10 right side up and upside down 10, 10, 10. And um, so I, yeah, I'm interested in seeing what is the deal is with that, um, if they have any symmetries and what that might mean. Uh, yeah, so that's it. Thanks for a very, very nice talk. Thank you. And I guess um, there might be time for uh, questions after after all the talk.